Hi guys, it's Stella. Um, today I'm talking to the series producer and the co-host, Damali, of Mothers of Invention. How are you doing? I'm good, Stella. How do you find your way to Mothers of Invention? Well, it has become one of my favourite podcasts, as we know, oh. and that's why we're teaming up together. Um, you know, for me, it really is, you know, the fact that you're all women is, is a good one for me. I love men, but I love that, you know, women really, <laughs> really working toward and, you know, empowering and championing climate change, I think, seems to be super effective and has, you know, I think, I think that's really powerful. And I think we're, we're so like-minded in our approach. I think that for me is the main kind of reason that I really warm towards everything that you guys are doing is that, you know, I think that you guys have a great sense of humor. The, the approach to such a serious topic, I think is, is really refreshing. And it's stellar, I think that we're very similar in that respect, you know, a kind of lightness of heart and of touch around issues that are obviously really terrifying and, and serious. You know, I feel very in tune with, with you guys on that respect. And then also the fact that it's solution driven. You know, I, I don't think that it's fair to kind of beat people around the head with, okay. with climate change and, and all of the, the issues without saying, you know what, this is what we can do. And a very small thing can have a really big impact if we're all in this together. And, and I love the, the way that you guys do that. I think we're quite aligned in that respect. So I think that's what sort of really made me look to you, you ladies as, as an inspiration. Oh, thank you. We obviously admire you too. You've been in the game since day <laughs> dots, basically. So, <laughs> so we are all about climate justice, which is like the human rights aspect of climate change. And we feature these you know, black, brown and indigenous women and girls from all over the world who are living on the front lines of the climate crisis. So who better to ask for the best solutions than people who are surviving it and have been surviving it? I couldn't agree more. I just, you know, there's so many issues to do with just having racial equality and, and being able to talk and fight for climate change. So the fact that you ladies are really, you know, working hard to represent everyone on the planet. And, and as you say, there's a lot of women are totally on the front line of getting affected first and foremost. So they need to be able to shout the loudest and be heard and seen and given a, a platform. You know, you, you ladies are giving an amazing platform just for, for knowledge. I think that's what's so important. You're giving critical information. And, you know, unless we have the information, we can't really make the right choices. So I think that, you know, if we, we can tell it in a way that feels welcoming and digestible, and, and, and as we said before, provide some kind of clear solution. You guys are doing a great job at, at having that impact, I think, across the world. Well, thank you, Stella. We are trying over here. You're welcome. You. It's true. <laughs> it's true though, you know, and I think also, again, you know, we're always sort of, ha we're always having a laugh whenever I talk to you. Exactly, nailed it. Couldn't have said it better myself. The reason we're launching today is because this week is NYC Climate Week, which is yep. a huge event in the climate calendar. But particularly today, because uh, thanks to the youth climate movement who are leading this thing, today is also the global day of climate action. Socially distanced leading. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Socially distanced protests on the street. Yeah. They're doing digital de demonstrations as well all day. So you can yeah. check them out on the Fridays for Future website. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got a link in bio, in fact. But also just settling in with you and me for the first part of this trilogy that we've got going on Stella is also going yeah. to be an excellent way to participate in the things that are going on today. We can go to like Comic-Con or something soon if oh. we keep our trilogies going. We can start a little kind of like, you know, superhero situation. You're going to have to start designing the outfits now. I was so inspired when we met last time and Mary being the first female president ever in Ireland. It's like, it's pretty major. She's a force to be reckoned with. She is, maybe even cooler than Obama, one might argue, yeah. you know? Ooh. We can have that debate next time. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna show everyone that the climate movement is very strong and has an amazing active community behind it and has incredible women leaders behind it too. Today launches the first of three of our all-time favorites from the show. My Mothers of Invention co-host is resident funny lady, Maeve Higgins, and she's going to kick us off with one of our favorite guests ever, Tara Hauska. Tara is a climate lawyer and an indigenous activist from the Coochie Ching First Nation in Minnesota, up in the Midwest of the US. And we featured Tara in our very first season back in 2018. So much has happened since then. 
And Tara has been smashing it out the park thanks to support from folks like Stellavision viewers right here. So everyone can participate in getting behind these issues. Yeah, you know, I'm a huge fan of Tara. She is a real inspiration, I think, in leading indigenous activists. And I just think that all the work that she's been doing on the oil pipelines is so incredibly important. You know, it's such a tough fight that, that she's facing and that we're all facing on that movement, on that issue. So she's been really, really at the forefront in working on that in America. And I just think that she's a force to be reckoned with. You know, I admire everything she's doing and she's fearless, so she's definitely one of us. And you know, and I, I'm truly, truly in awe of, of everything that she's been working on. And I really want to thank her for being part of this because she's hugely inspirational to me. She is. Let's do this, Stella. Well, I'm delighted. I'm really excited to introduce you to like anybody who doesn't know about you. I'm a big Instagram fan of yours. Would you enjoy it? Do you like get what do you get from it? I began social media as a useful campaigning tool. I don't really know that I'm following Instagram laws that are unspoken. <laughs> I just post things that I'm like, I bet people probably haven't seen this. I mean, maybe they'd be interested in this and like keep hoping that I get as many likes on the selfies that people love so much versus like the, hey, we chained a bunch of human beings to a pipeline today to try to protect the planet. Like that's the frustrating yeah. part of Instagram for me. It's like an amazing balance. I think that you strike, I suppose it, in your Instagram and also like day to day in your real life, like you're, you have all of this joy and life and like bubbling up through, especially when you're in Indian country, I feel like it's so wonderful and it's so fun for you to be there. And then there's also all of this really serious, like hardcore work that you do. Can I ask you about like how you first got involved in kind of, being a litigator for climate was it law school or when I went to law school and mm -hmm. I thought I was gonna actually be a patent lawyer and then when I was in law school I started working in the Indian Child Welfare Law Center and saw this immense need for advocates and representation because they're just splitting Indian families apart <laughs> all the time by the state and that's still the case it's out of home placement in Minnesota is 17 to 1 the, the ratio of native kids versus non-native kids what what is that at, at home placement out of say? home placement so oh, they're uh, taking indian children out of their homes um by the state you know and putting them into the system into child you know um, services and child protection and and so i i went out to washington dc to work at a tribal law firm at the same time i was seeing like you know this this pipeline called Keystone XL that I had had personal experience with when I worked back at the White House Council on Environmental Quality. I was like an intern there and saw this pipeline. And like, to me, it was so many things all at once, right? It was like lack mm -hmm. of consent by Indian people, you know, violation of their rights and protection of land and this, like the U.S. just screwing over Native people again and putting everybody at risk. And so I got, I started to do like basically protests during my lunch break. Um, the first time I ever went to a march actually was in 2014 um, and marched alongside the Cowboy and Indian Alliance who were putting up teepees on the mall. They came all the way from North Dakota, South Dakota, and Minnesota to do that and I in Nebraska. My involvement with Keystone XL actually was like, so I started writing about it, but you know, I went to this first march, but I also was like at the law firm, was trying to do as much pro bono as I could as like a first year mm. associate. So Keystone XL... Like, can you explain what that is for anyone who doesn't who, who doesn't know? Keystone XL is a massive tar sands pipeline mm -hmm. um, coming from Alberta, Canada. It, go, it It's proposed to go through the Ogallala Aquifer, it's one of the mm -hmm. largest freshwater aquifers in the world. It actually passes directly through the Cheyenne River Sioux Reservation um, and goes through this thing called the Mini Wachoni, um, you know, water system. It's the, the water system that provides all of the drinking water for the Oglala Sioux tribe and for yeah. many different nations along the, in that area. Keystone XL was shut down by the Obama administration. And now it's been brought back by the Trump administration. Right. I understand. It was like in the week after the Trump administration began that he kind of like kicked off all of these huge new projects. So, and also like, as you're speaking, I, I get why like it, it like intersects with all of these things that you are interested in or that you fight I guess not like yeah not like oh this is how I want to spend my time these are all of my hobbies it's like and then how did it end up with like people chaining themselves to <laughs> machinery the graduation 
yeah, so I, I mean, essentially what, what ended up happening is I was doing all this, you know, advocacy work for for this tribe, uh, for Oglala Sioux tribe and so some of the other tribes that were along the proposed route. And I ended up meeting um, a longtime organizer advocate for Indian country named Winona LaDuke. And, you know, she started kind of like trying to recruit me to come and work with her. Right. And I kept working on other issues, you know, in, in D.C., including the Oak Flat um, mine situation, which is the San Carlos Apache has a sacred site. And there was a proposal to basically mine all the copper out from underneath of it and let the site collapse. Right. This is like where they do their coming of age ceremonies. This is like super sacred to their people. And so I started working on that and, you know, trying to help them get connections into D.C., get, you know, some mm-hmm. television, get some any type of coverage on the issue. Mm-hmm. And so I got connected to them, but also to, to Bernie Sanders. And right. that was through like the introduction of the Keep It in the Ground Act. So keep fossil fuels in the ground and started to work on all these different issues kind of like in my own time. But then I was organizing yeah. and doing actual demos myself. And eventually Winona convinced me to come and work with her. Mm-hmm. at the same time that Bernie Sanders convinced me to come and work with him. And so I did that at the same time. And then a few months later, Bernie was out of the race, and these runners came to D.C. from Standing Rock Sioux Reservation. They'd run 2,000 miles, bringing their message out to the White House about this pipeline they were trying to protect their lands from. And they were telling people to come back. And we had been working on that sort of through Under the Earth, like the small little encampment. But when that mm-hmm. happened... And then this elder named LaDonna Allard went on Facebook Live, which was a brand new thing at that time in Mm -hmm. 2016. I literally just packed up my stuff into a rental car and and drove from D.C. out to this place I'd never been in North Dakota. And essentially, it never really went back. You know, I've I've just been doing land defense and all the other things um, at the same time. It's incredible. I mean... When you say it like that, that like, first of all, an elder went on Facebook Live, like this new tech, that's incredible. These runners appeared and like, how could you resist that urgency, right? And I feel like in 2016, like that Standing Rock movement, it was really one of the biggest moments around Native American um, sovereignty in many of our lifetimes. What would you say was the kind of successful outcome of that movement? I would say that for me, and I think I can't speak for other people, but I, mm. I know that the reason I was so drawn to that particular fight, you know, knowing that there were so many different fights going across Indian country and there have been for so long, mm. was it felt different somehow. It felt like people are not only saying no, they're going to stand in front of the machines and they're going to they're gonna force them to, to, to stop, you know, and that felt so different to me. And it was so, you know, and then we saw hundreds of nations coming in in this beautiful resistance that was built and and all of a sudden this message was being heard around the world so i think the, the biggest win that i see coming out of the dakota access resistance was that people heard about indian people again and mm-hmm. recognized that you know we're still here and mm-hmm. that our lands are still greatly at risk that we are still dealing with this disparate conditions living conditions justice conditions you know mm-hmm. like we're not able to prosecute non-native people like anybody else could like any other state or country could native people have actually had been stripped of jurisdictional authority so like to me it was this awareness that that this is happening and now we see other fights so like keystone xl and the one i'm fighting line three and trans mountain pipeline and kind of like this really strong recognition of indigenous resistance could you set the scene of what standing rock was like when you were there i mean it was a it was a place that was an opportunity to build a a different community there is this obviously like very intense and brutal scene happening if you are out on the on a front line where you're actually trying to stop the construction of the code access pipeline. But then back into the encampments themselves, there is you know, different nations and different people from, from all over. You gotta remember it's also like you're you're sharing food and, and language and teachings and stories for, with each other like all these native nations and also a lot of allies there's that but then you're also looking overhead and there's helicopters everywhere and mm-hmm. snipers on hills and um, sometimes tanks that were waiting just past the tree line right so it's a it was a very intense environment wow and also like I really appreciate you talking about this it's not I know it's not like a fun memory 
you know so thanks for sharing seriously yeah i went i actually burned out during sandy rock it's like a really hard time that Mm -hmm. i'm writing about it now i am working on my book i swear to god i have another agent i've given them half a draft yeah it's sandy rock is such a hard time it really was like it is really beautiful but it was really really hard too is the writing i don't know is it helping to clarify things for you or is it just like re bringing stuff up like one of the requests that she had was to like actually take her through a day at at camp and Mm. it made me remember all the really like beautiful parts too so like Mm. visiting with each other and like going to sit at these campfires and share food with each other getting to hear all these different stories like that was really beautiful i mean like you really put your bodies on the line like can you explain like what what happened on the ground yeah kind of i mean it we're seeing that now in like the the George Floyd demonstrations. So mm-hmm. like this, you know, incredible brutality driven response um, on behalf of law enforcement and private security. So in the case of Dakota Access, what we saw was like, you know, massive private security forces that were hired by the company. Um, they actually used attack dogs on on our people and pepper spray, mace, tear gas, you know, round the clock surveillance, like helicopters overhead every single day, all night long, snipers on the hills around us, around, around the encampment. At one point they brought in a grenade launcher, you know, like, or like a, like a miss, it was a missile launcher. Actually, it was a missile launcher. The level of violent response is so extreme, you know, and that's something I see now in the work I do. I mean, it's shocking, but, but as you said, like now that's happening to you know non-native people as well so maybe there's going to be more affinity i don't think and i would say like that brutality is not new i mean there's like the the, we saw that in the demonstrations at ferguson we saw that in the Mm -hmm. demonstrations against a lot of these like you know uh murders of of black men and black women that have happened incredibly violent response you know i mean when it comes to people that are willing to stand unarmed that i think scares the establishment more than anything really can you know like Mm -hmm. There's a, obviously, I I think there's an importance and, you know, it's critical that people engage in policy work, that people are pushing for these changes inside, that people are working within electoral politics and all the things. But at the same time, like what I've personally witnessed is that there is nothing that strikes fear and strikes like that these people really care about, you know, either their very lives when you're talking about being killed at the hands of cops or the land that we're trying to protect mm-hmm. you know it it scares them it, it really really does something else that like c- kind of reached me through all of the noise um was this divestment movement like while all of this was going on um land protection there was protests in the cities right like outside banks about um you know these banks are, who are funding these kind of fossil fuel companies Could you tell us about the divestment protests? Because like it's I guess it's all well and good to raise awareness or to kind of say morally, you know, we've won. But like actually the money (laughs) is so important, too. Right. Right. And and Dakota Access Pipeline was built. You know, I mean, that was one of Trump's first things. Like you said, it was like within Mm. a first week of office. He's like Dakota Access is back on, you know, and. I knew that as a as an organizer on the ground in November when he won, that that was most likely going to be the case, you know, and it just was yeah. so heartbreaking. But when we actually physically got barricaded in, so like the divestment movement was like a, it was a moment where we had physically been blockaded into the encampment in North Dakota. Like there's one road going into it um, and the, the police had, had created this barrier and we had to go all the way around. And so we couldn't actually physically put ourselves in front of the machines anymore. And meanwhile, you got all these people around the world saying, how do I help? What do I do? You know, what's the best yeah. way to get involved? And there was this article that had been written um, about the 17 banks behind Dakota Access. Yeah. And so we were like, here's something you can do. Go to these funders. Here's a list of them mm-hmm. and tell them to stop funding human rights abuses and this, you know, gross violation of humanity that's happening to, to Native people. But then there was also, you know, the recognition that there had been this ongoing divestment movement that had been in place for decades, you know, largely by colleges divesting. And but here's this massive uptick in like attention on specifically money behind fossil fuels and all these people chaining themselves to banks and locking down and like, you know, really like drawing attention to the the bank's roles in these things. And I think that those two really came together in like a way that's still 
going even now, like recognizing that you have to have people power if you want to get things inside done and you need to have inside power to make sure the people power is like reaching the right ears. Right. So yeah. 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 And then I started going out to, uh, visiting banks. Right. So going to Europe and, and visiting pension funds and banks and insurers and all those things. So what's the best way for like people to make that decision and, and take those actions to divest? Do you recommend? Uh, specifically on fossil fuels, like I'm mm-hmm. part of a coalition now that's formed of a bunch of NGOs, but also grassroots folks that led a lot of these actions in the streets and, um, you know, inside as well. Yeah. Centering impact to community because that was also something that I've been missing from that movement was like this really dedicated effort to center like here are the people that are hurt by this. They are the rights holders of these places. Mm-hmm. They should be the ones sitting there face to face being like, here is our lawsuit. Here is our like lack of consent. Here are our rights. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, that coalition is called Stop the Money Pipeline. Stop the Money so Pipeline. Yeah. Okay. Visit Stop the Money Pipeline. We have a website. You can yeah. learn how to like pull out your money. You can learn what banks are much better when it comes to investing in sustainability and, and yeah. not um, violating human rights. Hey, thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, Thanks for watching to everybody who's been watching. You've had us some really enormous wins that we haven't had time to dig into. So you can hear us chat about that on our Minnesota and about the specific ways regular people like all of you watching now um, help to make those wins possible. So go and listen and you can find Mothers of Invention at the usual podcast hideouts or find us at Mothers Invent on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. So thanks for watching and thank you, Tara.